let's get started. Hello, thank you very much. I'm thank you very much for having me on this um, review board today for Galaxy Cars. Um, I'm Johan from Berlin. I'm a Salesforce architect. I help companies achieve their business goals by having a properly architected Salesforce solution. Today, we want to talk about Galaxy Cars. The company um, sells cars since more than 80 years. They have five different makes or brands, as they call it, and they sell about 5 million cars per year to distributors. The project scope today is to um, set up a Salesforce so they can negotiate and place orders and track at the delivery on track the delivery and the sales of vehicles together with the distributors. So we have two main actors. These are the internal users and our distributors, and they will work in conjunction. For the org strategy, I go with single org strategy. Uh, we are not close to a lot of limits. The limits which we are close, we can manage. On top of that, uh, we have no regular uh, legal requirements and um, a big overlap between the different data and process and people. And uh, for translation, I go with custom trans. Uh, we need translation since we are in multiple countries. We will use custom labels, translation, workbench, and community translation. And since we are in many different countries, my assumption was we will need multi currency, but there was no explicit statement for that. For actors and licenses, and for risks and assumptions, I see um, two assumptions. First, the inventory system can APIs can be used. Uh, we have to make sure that this works, so we have to early on test and and. Um, test that. And, and for risks, I see the temp dependency risk to build on the canvas to adopt the accounting system to have a, a support canvas SDK and the delivery risk for the mobile publisher. For the dependency risk, we have to define together with the team for the accounting system, we have to define um, milestones, uh, contract first developments and the requirements and throughout the project, make sure that we achieve the um, agreed milestones. And for the mobile publisher app, um, the iOS app store can take um, an Android app Play Store can take between days and weeks. We should account for that and submit the app early on. This concludes the first sections. Now we go over to actors and licenses. We have four different actors, two internal and two external. I want to start with the external actors. The distribute the vehicle buyers. Uh, we'll need the partner community in order to use the opportunity object. For the distribute the fleet managers, they only need the customer community since they need sales order. All sharing can be done as far as I could see that via share sets. For our account managers and our management team, we need sales orders in order to give them access to sales cloud in order to give them access to sales orders. And our role hierarchy, um, we have the senior management at the top in order to see all the data rolling up. Then below that, we have the regions 1 to 25. And within each region, we have one or many management uh, teams. This was not clearly specified. My assumption was only one, uh, one team, which is a management. And below that, we have the account managers. And then below that, um, the distributor roles, which are external roles. Therefore, I highlighted in yellow. And for the system landscape, we have I want to start at the top with our mobile apps. We have two different mobile apps. We have the Salesforce mobile app for our internal users, and we have the partner app for our distributor users. The partner app will be published via the mobile publisher. Um, this has the advantages of having um, a better branding, and um, the user does not have to add, enter the password all the time. Both of them are connected via OAuth, REST, and the user agent flow. For single sign-on, as we have an Active Directory uh, LDAP server in place, in order to allow single sign-on with Salesforce, um, we have to use something like Okta, an identity, an IDP. My assumption was there's no IDP in place yet. Then we have the accounting system. Um, excuse me, I forgot one arrow here, which is connected to Salesforce um, once via the Canvas app, via Canvas, and on top of them also via the ESP. The ESP we, for the whole integration, um, we use an ES API led integration pattern, which means we avoid point to point integrations as much as possible. So the accounting system is also connected via sal with Salesforce via the ESP. The same is true for the inventory system, which is connected with Salesforce via the ESP as well with the ETL. The ETL and the ESP are both behind the firewall. The fi and both are connected to Salesforce via OAuth, REST, and JWT uh, Bearer token flow, and they both use mutual SSL. Um, the ETL will also feed data from Salesforce to the data warehouse and vice versa, as well as the ETL will be used to import data from our existing multiple CRM teams, which are decommissioned into Salesforce. 
Within Salesforce, we use the sales cloud, uh, sales cloud exclusively on top of our Lightning platform. We have my domain enabled. And we, use, uh, we have a customer community or partner community, which we call distributor community. Uh, we have two app exchange packages installed, Conga Composer and DocuSign. Bo uh, both in conjunction create orders for order signing. And for our BI requirements, we use Tableau CR CRM, formerly known as Einstein Analytics. And this concludes already my, my system landscape. I will skip the business entities for now and we'll go straight to the data model. Um, at the core of our data model, we have accounts and contacts. Let me zoom in one more time so it's easier. Um, accounts and contacts. Um, for OWD, I follow the uh, concept of the least privilege, which means all objects are private by default. For um, uh, for accounts and contacts, they are private and both are owned by, uh, by the account manager. For the accounts, we have an, uh, we use a record ah, yeah, later to that. Um, they are about 10,000 accounts or 10,100,000 contacts. I didn't know how many people actually work at each distributor. Then for our, first of all, we have for each distributor, we have for each model, models are, are modeled via um, the product itself. Also each model is what each model is one product, which leads to about 240 different products. Um, for, in order to model how many, how many models are agreed on with one customer, uh, with one distributor, I use a junction object, which is called model allocation between product and distributor. So to walk you through, we know distributor A is allowed to set a minimum and maximum from model B. On the product itself, we, has a, we have a custom field, which is a pick list field, which, um, which defines the, the make or the brand. And this way we can uh, differentiate on, uh, no, sorry, uh, not the make and the break, sorry, not the make and the break. The price books themselves model um, the makes and the brands. And so we can control which of our distributor via price book sharing has access to which um, models and products and brands. For our sales process, we have the we use opportunities and orders. Our um, salespeople, our account managers, create to, to um, together with the distributor vehicle buyers, create opportunities and opportunity products. This is about, uh, according to my assumption, 600,000 opportunities calculated on five years. Opportunity products will definitely be a large data volume. For large data volume, for opportunity products and order products, we should follow the archive and purge strategy in the first place, which means opportunity product and order product are only stored in the system as long as absolutely necessary. As soon as they are not necessary anymore, we move them to the data warehouse where we can retrieve them on demand since the data warehouse will be treated as a hot storage system. On top of that, we will use custom indexes in order to make our reports and list views and queries selective as well as, as skinny tables between custom fields and standard fields. Um, once the opportunity, which is the negotiation, let me add that here, between, negotiation, between our distributor and our, um, and our company, once this is agreed on and the contract is signed, we create an order with order products. I separated the opportunity from the order product object in order um, to control the sharing um, between the two user groups of fleet managers and vehicle buyers. The requirement was that fleet managers are not seeing anything about the negotiations or, or the pricing. Therefore, I give them only access to the order and order product, but not to opportunities. Once the order and order products um, order is starting to get shipped, we model the vehicles itself as assets in Salesforce. This is with 75 million by far the biggest um, volume, this large data volume. Um, 75 million, since this object is not heavily used in any automation, we should get we should be able to handle that. Nevertheless, we should follow the stream strategy, only store what we absolutely need, use custom indexes uh, and skinny tables. And this already concludes almost my data model. There is now the exception. If our customers request opportunity, as a pro, um, product uh, models out of their predefined range, we have to create an exception request to our, and which is then approved in turn by our management. And in order to, the exception request holds the different um, exceptions, which are modeled again as model allocations. And this concludes my data model, and which I want to go over to our. Um, business requirements. So as I talked already before, um, the maximum minimum allocation for each model for each distributor um, are 
are defined before as model allocation. In the tier itself, I model as a price box. So for tier A, I add all the models which can be bought by customers who are a part of a premium tier. For premium tier. Um, and then if the distributor places an order, how many vehicles for each model? Um, they do not place the order directly, but they create an opportunity and opportunity product initially. The price books are predefined via pick list from the account tier, like premium, um, are, are pre-assigned via the account tier, which is defined on the account as a pick list field. Um, and the models are, as I said, modeled as products. I considered using only orders as said, but no clear separation between distributor and fleet managers would then be possible. And out of the box. Um, then if the number of requests for each model falls within the allocation per model, um, it's automatically pre-approved the state and the account manager is notified. So um, on save for opportunity products, we have a trigger in place which check if the model allocation for the sp specific distributor allows uh, falls within the maximum the minimum as defined on the opportunity product for each model. If this is true, we set the opportunity status to pre-approved and we inform the account manager via process builder and chatter. But if the account number request for each model falls outside of the allocation per model, the account manager is as well informed, but we have to do more logic. So we create a chat message to inform the account manager um, if this happens. On top of, we use the same trigger logic, logic as in the requirement before. On top of that, um, to determine the distributor's current status, we have a couple of systems. So first we have, um, I, we use an, Excuse me, we use we do not use a Lightning Web component in the account page. No, we use uh, the Canvas app. We ex extend the accounting application to work as a Canvas app. And we include the Canvas app into Salesforce to show the financial health and distrib uh, distribution, which is shown in the accounting application. My assumption was the accounting application already displays this information nicely. And since it's, it's a web app, um, it should be easily adopted to work as a Canvas app. Nevertheless, um, I considered using a Lightning Web component um, with an account, on the account page via Apex Callout. The second one is the distributor sales history, which should be available in the Salesforce application. My assumption is the sales history is represented as orders, and I want to display an order summary on the account again via Lightning Web component. Why did I choose a Lightning Web component here? My assumption was we have to um, summarize the sales history and make it the information meaningful instead of just um, showing all the orders and all the products models our customer bought in the past. And we have to create an exception. Once we have done that, we have to create an exception assessment management with uh, proposing a new minimum maximum for each type, uh, which we are willing to sell to the distributor. So we create an exception record. And for the exception record, we have the child records for model allocation childs. On the model allocation, um, which they have their own record type, which is the um, suggested except which with the record type um, exception. Uh, we sent the assessment to the management for approval together with the account status information. And this is done via standard Salesforce approval management. My assumption here, the approval has to go to the manager as defined on the user record. We will adopt the approval page to display the account status page as uh, components as defined before. This is the second reason why I went with the Lightning Web component for the sales history to make it easy for our management to make this decision. And lastly, for the distributor to reach a deal with, uh, we work with the distributor to reach a deal with the range specific, uh, specified. My assumption here was this is a simple discussion back and forth, so we can use chatter on the opportunity record itself. Um, I considered Quip for more complex discussions. Um, then we go to, come from the first stage to the second stage to the order stage. This is where the order product, order and order product object comes into place. Um, we will have in this vehicle order details are signed and finalized into a contract. So electronically signed orders are sent from, key, um, from Galaxy cars and trucks to the distributor. So we create an order document via Conga Composer and this we send this for digital signal via DocuSign to our um, distributors. And once the distributor have signed and returned the contract within a specific time, we update our opportunity um, to the status signed and then in turn create an order. Uh, we send the document digitally signed document via DocuSign envelope to the distributor. As my assumption is we do this via email and not via embedded signing. And we can set for the envelope an expiration date. And once the contract is received, um, the, inf the order information should be routed to the inventory system and the order financials to the accounting system. 
Once the contract is signed, we update the opportunity status and create the order. This order creation in turn updates update triggers um, via a fire for get remote process integration via the platform events to the ESP. So the ESP gets a message and says new order created. The ESP in turn create um, orchestrates um, a call in into Salesforce to get all the required information from Salesforce and routes that not only to the accounting system, but also to the financial system. Um, and this uh, to the inventory system. Um, and we will use cost, custom uh, common external ID fields between the systems to route the data to the appropriate customer. And this concludes the second stage. And now we go to the third stage, the post order stage. In this stage, the vehicles included in the order are tracked. The vehicle identification number, the VIN number, is the corner, uh, care cornerstone here. So the VIN, should, uh, the VIN should then be provided to the Salesforce application. And the status of each VIN should be set to tra in transit. I will suggest this asset object to store the vehicles as. The asset object has a couple of advantages. And one of them is that the asset object does not count against the data storage. Um, the VIN will be stored as a custom field, which is um, enabled as external ID on the asset. And the asset status gets the status field, which is called then in transit. And the inventory system creates updates the vehicles in Salesforce via remote call via remote call in. Of course, all of that is um, orchestrated again via the ESP. And this distributor fleet manager, this external user, should be able to track the location of the order in transit. Uh, my assumption is the order location is always available in the inventory system. Therefore, we create a small Lightning Web component, which does via remote process invocation, request and reply pattern via the Apex controller up on load up on displaying of the order page, displays the current location of the order in transit. And once the order is delivered, the fleet manager should be given two business days to acknowledge the receipt of the delivery. This is done by verifying the vehicles by win one by one. This, this is my, the status of the win in Salesforce should then be changed to available. My assumption was the inventory system is the absolute master for this whole process. Therefore, we will not update the status of the win in Salesforce directly, but we will have the order first. Let's start the order update in the inventory system up to the status in Salesforce. Once the status in Salesforce is updated, we show um, via a Lightning Web component to make it easy for our distributor to confirm the win for the win for the distributors. The confirmation sends an update to the inventory system via request and reply remote process invocation via the ESP based on the win our external ID. This success in turn when the request come, replace, uh, comes from our inventory system, we update the status in Salesforce to available. Um, and we will have a scheduled flow on the delivery date of the order itself to check if the fleet manager is confirmed. There's no specific requirement. What actually should happen is this fleet manager does not do it within two days. My assumption was he should be notified. And on a weekly basis, the wins are currently uh, um, uh, the distributors provide information to the inventory system regarding which wins are currently in stock and which have already been sold. So this um, in stock and sold are the status fields on the win itself on the asset. So in order, since this is not um, time critical information because it's done on a weekly basis, my assumption is we can use a daily batch integration via the bulk, since it's large data volume, very likely to update, update the win status based on the distributor input in Salesforce. It, this is done via remote call in um, via the ETL this time, because it's a bulk integration and um, on a weekly basis. And this concludes our business process requirements. We now go to the data requirements. For legal reasons, the Salesforce system must retain copies of the initial request for inventory. Therefore, we keep the store. The, uh, uh, we keep the excuse me. This, we store the opportunities and the opportunity products in Salesforce. Um, once we do not need them in Salesforce anymore, we can move them. Um, here it says the Salesforce system must retain copies of. I would like to ask, um, talk to the legal department if it's okay if we move the data over to data warehouse once it's not important any for more for operational reasons in Salesforce. All negotiations between the account manager and distributor have to be locked. Therefore, we use the standard Salesforce lock email and locker call functionality in Salesforce. And the signed order um, have to be locked. Therefore, we actually attach the signed order document to the order record and to the opportunity record on top. And lastly, the status of each bin has to be tracked, but the requirement says we have to at, um, at least track when it was delivered and when it was first sold. I would like to denormalize this information by having two date fields, which are on the asset object itself, um, delivered and sold date, and both are filled when the respective status is reached the first time. And this concludes the 
the part about um, this and now we have to go to data migration requirements. Uh, we have to make the vehicles by make and model for the last 15 years available. Um, so for on the products first, we have a pick list field which defines the make and the models is is modeled as products. We have about 250 from them, but we will have seven, uh, 75 million assets, which is a very large data volume, but as said before, can be handled in Salesforce. Sales by distributor for each vehicle for the last 15 years. Um, this is assumption vehicle only sold once. So therefore we, we link the vehicle to the distributor via a lookup relationship. Does not create any more um, data. In addition, distributors information will come from a very variety of systems. For this import requirements, I recommend that we do an extract from the source system, then off platform we clean, standardize and deduplicate all this data, then we create external IDs on this on this op on the we create external IDs for all entries for the, for the logical linking. Then we do a test load where we use the upstart functionality based on the external IDs. So we first load the accounts, then the contacts, then the orders, the order products, and the assets um, into our staging sandbox. Uh, once our subject matter experts confirm that everything looks good and we do cross-checking with the source system, we load it into our production data. If there was new data in the meantime coming up, we do a delta load. Um, into our production. In order to make it as easy as possible we, and painless as possible, um, we will not do any manual step, but will have a fully scripted process, which means it every every step and every manipulation will be scripted in the ETL and therefore can be also stored in our um, in our code uh, source code environment. And now we come to the data access requirements. The, the management team should see all data belonging to their assigned account managers, but the account managers should not see the data belonging to other account managers. So as said before, I will set all objects to private with the concept of the least privilege. The account managers itself are the managers in the role hierarchy and we use roll up, uh, roll up via the role hierarchy. The senior management should see the roll up data across all regions. Therefore, I put the senior management at the top of the role hierarchy. And the fleet managers should not see any negotiations or cost information. Therefore, I um, give them a profile and license based um, setting. So I removed access to opportunity, which is done via the customer community license. So, and we should not store any cost information on the order object or order product. So we will add um, dummy prices into the order product um, record. And unfortunately, we cannot remove the standard fields or um, unit price from and list price from the order record or the product record. Um, I considered here creating a custom lightning web component. And for the distributors, uh, we should only, they should only see information regarding makes their tiers allows them to sell. I will, tiers are modeled as price books. Price books are set to a uh, uh, private and the products are only shared via price book assignments and our distributors are, um, the products are automatically shared with the distributors using public groups because a distributor is added to the public group as um, which belongs to their tier. Then all managers uh, will be using iPads and Android tablets um, to review account plans. We will use the standard Salesforce mobile app. I recommend to build custom mobile optimized pages, which can be done to use um, the account plans more efficiently. And distribute fleet managers would like to able to check the status of shipments from a mobile device. Again, I would recommend to use um, to build a uh, to expose the partner community as a mobile publisher app, as I said before, for better branding and automatic login without entering the password all the time. And top of that, um, I recommend to create focused mobile uh, mobile pages, pages to check the status of shipments. And we would, for reporting, we would like to analyze selling trends by distributor to identify potential upsell opportunities, determine limits for next order ordering period, determine the relationship with poor performance. This sounds a good use case for sales for standard reports on platform. We will use opportunity and opportunity product reports grouped and filtered by distributor. And but for view overall trending um, to readjust factory output, and this should include trends by make and model by region and so forth. This is definitely a large data volume record, um, which needs more complex calculations. Therefore, uh, therefore I recommend Tableau CRM, not RCM, CRM, formerly known as Einstein Analytics. And this already brings me to the last section to the development and lifecycle management requirements. Um, we have multiple development teams around the world, uh, which operate in 10 different cities. They are currently find themselves overwriting each other's code and make region, spe 
when they make region-specific enhancements, which should better manage their code base. In order to achieve that, I recommend to do um, source-driven development. So the, so the source of truth is always in our, so in our Git where we have all the code. On top of that, we use a CICD pipeline, which is as automated as much as possible. And in order to make even better code and allow them to not only uh, others help each other's code to make region-specific enhancements, we will implement a center of excellence and Scrum of Scrum, as well as Scrum of Scrums. More to that later. Currently, the local support teams cannot are not able to fix each other's region because they don't follow their coding standards. There is no coding standards in place. Um, but we would like to provide global support in, in its request. Of, and we should, um, and I want to recommend for us to implement a center of excellence, which defines and encourages or even enforces coding guidelines and best practice. And on top of that, we should continuously learn in the team um, and make knowledge sharing, peer programming, and pull requests. We do have the coding um, standard improve all the time. And in the past, we had bugs showing which have been fixed in UAT, but still show up in bug. Uh, but the, the testing team can tries to manually test all the use cases of the deployment, but this is not feasible. So we should prevent this from occurring again. Bug fixes are sent um, to all colleagues automatically um, via the CI part of CI/CD. So as soon as somebody, um, furthermore, we will have merge conflicts um, in our, co since we do source driven development and not send, and not sandbox driven development anymore. And we will have automatic testing implemented via Proba. As the last step of the implementation, we will remove admin, pre admin privileges in all sandbox but the scratch orgs for our administrators and developers. So only the CICD pipeline can move changes forward. And lastly, they want to release uh, the order, uh, the, uh, release it to the other regions, uh, first to the US based office and then to the other regions after. And each region may have region specific requirements that need to be defined. Let me first talk about the region specific requirements in detail. Um, I recommend we use um, second generation unlocked, pack, uh, unlocked packages in order to develop modularized packages. So we have base packages, and then on top of that, we have region specific packages. And within the region specific packages, we should define clear boundaries. And clear, um, on top of that, we should use um, custom settings, custom metadata, record types and page layouts, as well as permission sets, permission set groups as much as possible to have a clean separation of concerns within our code and to make extensibility and adoptability one of our highest priorities. And for the project management itself, we will use vAgile. So waterfall for the integration adoptions we have to do and for the fixed requirements. And within that, we will use Scrum for fast deliveries for iterative cycles where we use work in two week springs. And local requirements are gathered um, not only via the local per product owners and the local center of excellence, but of, as well with um, the local management team and the local power user team. And before we conclude our presentation, I want to walk you through um, the CICD pipeline. Uh, we can start at the top left. Um, we have our developers work in our feature sandboxes, which are scratch works where they do the unit testing. By the way, for tools, we will use Cupado, PMD, Jenkins, Prova, Git, and Jira. Jira for our traceability matrix, Git for source driven development, Prova and Jenkins in conjunction for automatic testing, and PMD for our static code analysis. Once our developers are happy with um, the code they developed in the feature sandbox, they um, create a um, they do a merge, uh, they do a pull, create a pull request to merge the code from the feature branch into the developer branch. Um, this merge, we do auto static code analysis there. On top of that, we have a manual pull, re uh, pull request approval by our senior development teams. Once this is approved, the code is automatically built in our build sandbox, it is, which is a scratcher where we do automatic regression testing. This regression testing is based on the biggest impact and likeliest um, errors in our process. Once this is everything is goes fine, we move forward to the QA, QA, QA org. The QA org is um, where our QA team does functional testing based on our acceptance criteria from our tickets. This is a Dev Pro sandbox. By the way, the data in the scratch orgs and in the Dev Pro sandbox, as well as in the partial copy sandbox, is controlled as well by Git. So the development team and the QA team are together responsible to always have highest quality test data available, which can be automatically pushed into any sandbox. Once the QA team is successfully testing, every, by the way, if anything goes wrong, always um, the code is then sent back to the feature branch and and, um, and, the, and removed from the dev branch. So the dev branch is always clean. 
And then the developer has to fix anything and then this whole process starts again. Then once the QA team is happy, we move everything into the UAT org where our subject matter experts as well as our product owners and product managers test if the feature um, is, success, is developed as required. And lastly, we move it into the staging org, which is the end -to -end, where the end-to-end -end test can happen, where we do the performance load and migration test, and performance test, of course, only do in uh, conjunction with Salesforce support. And if everything goes fine there, we go into the smoke into production, um, which is feeds from the release branch. If everything goes fine with the release branch into the reduction, it's moved into the primary branch. The primary branch is always a 100% copy of the reduction, because if we have any issues um, in our production org, which we missed, um, we will fix them immediately in our hotfix branch and hotfix org, which feed directly from the primary branch. And once they are fixed in the hotfix org um, or hotfix branch, then they are propagated back into the lower environment. Please do not um, think these errors are developed, uh, actually um, change sets. No, all code is always deployed from our source, source code. And this brings me to the last requirement to our steer um, to our sent governance model. So on top of that, we have the steering committee, which makes sure that the pro the business pro the, the project um, is always aligned with the business goals. Below that, we have a global center of excellence. The global center of excellence contains the architecture review board, which make, um, defines and makes sure that the architecture is appropriately built. The change request board, which takes care of the changes, which are um, come up throughout the pro project, which um, then the QA team, the PMO and the project team, and the other stakeholders like the accounting team or the inventory IT team, as well as the local COEs. The Global Center of Excellence has not only the requirements to define and encourage coding standards, but they should also take care of any conflicts which arise between the teams, make sure the knowledge is always shared and the different project parts are always aligned properly. And this concludes my presentation for today. I want to use the last two minutes to talk a little bit about the um, the integration, uh, the user authentication between our mobile app. For our internal users, um, there is a Salesforce identity, con uh, uh, there's a SAML integration in place. So I recommend we use the user agent flow with, layered with the SAML flow. So we have four actors, the client at the top, which is the mobile app. Then we have the auth provider, a service provider, which is Salesforce. We have the IDP, which is our Okta. And then we have the resource server, which is Salesforce as well. So our client, client calls to the authorization endpoint and says, I need another token, a response type token, together with the client ID. The auth provider detects that a login is necessary. Therefore, it creates and signs a SAML request in, in its role as a service provider and redirects to the IDP login URL. So the redirect happens with the SAML request and the relay state. The IDP, in turn, um, verifies the signature. This is an optional part. Uses the SAML request, logs, asks the user for login if not happened yet, and creates and signs the SAML response. This is returned via redirect via post, uh, HTML form post um, to get the SAML response, also the signed SAML response and the relay state to the ACS URL. Um, where the uh, service provider verifies the signature, and uh, this is not optional, excuse me here, copy paste error, um, uses the SAML response. Um, if just in time provisioning is enabled, updates or creates the user, then it creates the session. Um, then um, ask the user, this is now the auth part again, for scope approval. And um, once the user approves, then it creates the access token and redirects to the redirect URL. And we are, with um, the redirect with the access token, the state, state and the scope to the client. The client extracts the access token from the URL and makes an access, accesses the API with the bearer type token, um, ask for the resources as it wants, then the resource server validates the token and re provides the requested resources. And this concludes my presentation for today. Thanks a lot. I'm looking forward to your questions and to your feedback. Okay, could you stop recording and give us some time? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. I'm back. Recording is running again. Okay, so Lawrence, you are more senior CTA, so let's start. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know two months makes you more senior. <laughs> let's, uh, <laughs> let's kick off. Um, so do you want to go first to your system landscape, please? Yes. Um, 
So I'm interested if you've so you suggested using Conga Composer and DocuSign. Mm -hmm. um, did you consider whether there's sort of a, yeah, a, a single vendor solution that would solve both Abs of those? Absolutely. I was considering Conga Composer has also the integration with Conga Sign. Um, there was no specific requirement here about embedded signing, but this is one of the bigger shortcomings of Conga Sign. And since this is a very common use case, especially for our partner distributor community, to have digital embedded signing, I went with a second solution. Uh, luckily, both solutions are very well integrated together and almost feel like one solution. Okay. Okay, Does this you. answer the question? Um, yeah, yeah, that, that answers that. Um, and can you um, can you talk about you suggested using Jotbearer flow for um, the ETL and ESB integrations? Could you talk about some of the considerations around the, that choice? Yes, absolutely. For the ESB and the ETL, both have a so-called headless integration with Salesforce on an autopilot. That means this should be running for years or on a, on time without any interaction from any human. Um, the Jotbearer token flow is a, one of the few flows which allow that. Um, on top of that, we can have as a that means there is no UI or user in, um, needed to exchange any token. So when the refresh token or assist or when the ESB needs a new refresh token or asset token, uh, access token, um, it just takes the short bearer token and sends it to the um, authorization endpoint and exchanges a uh, token endpoint and exchanges it for a new access token and refresh token, uh, access token. There's never a refresh token ex um, exchanged. Sorry for that. Is this um, enough for its consider um, justification yeah. here? Yeah, that's helpful. Thanks. And are there any other features that you need your ESB and ETL to support? Or well, in fact, specifically your ESB. Are there any other features that need to be supported that aren't mentioned in that um, that integration line there? Um, I honestly, as a, I have the two-way SSL here. What else does the ESB? The ESB has to support um, the plot um, event-driven event-driven architecture for our platform events. But other than that, I cannot pick up anything. Cool, cool, thanks. Oh yeah, um, the Boyux protocol uh, committee. I'm always having yeah. a hard time. Yeah, 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 thanks. Um, is that what you asked for? Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, Jakob, is there anything else you wanted to? Sure, I would like to see a data model, please. Yes, thank you very much. Junior CTA. I've got <laughs> a few <laughs> questions. First of all, I don't see information about sharing settings on product and price book. Could you explain how they are going to be set? Yes, um, the product itself is, this is a very well point. The product itself is set to, um, to private, as to none. As the sales for the product itself has has no o OWD settings, which you can set up. The price book itself is um, to define to none. And we will exclusively share it via the share table on the price book where we can reference partner users, public groups, internal users, and so forth. We will use public groups. Um, the, each public group represents one of the tiers, premium, lower, or is one of the tiers, um, which where we automatically add our distributors based on, our, on, on their performance. Does this answer the question? OK, yeah, that, that works for me. And, uh... Similar question about your assets. Uh, you have information that they are controlled by parent, mm -hmm. and meantime they put owner who is a system user. Could you walk me through this? Um, yes, as a, this is kind of a fun situation with the assets that they are technical. We can set up that they're sharing for control by parent, but nevertheless we have a technical system user in place. I didn't want to use the account manager or any other user, which is part of the role hierarchy as the owner, since we will have um, very likely ownership skew, and ownership skew can be mitigated by having an, o an owner which is not part of the role hierarchy. Okay, and. Uh, in situation you have 75 million assets and they are controlled by parent, uh, it means that you have master detail relationship under the hood, right? What is going to... Mm -hmm. I get your... Um, this is a very good point. There will be... Um, it's technically still a lookup relationship, but it behaves a lot less master detail relationship and we will have role lock errors uh, massively. We need to control by parents because we will have ownership skew as a lookup skew or master detail skew. Um, therefore, I changed my solution to private, uh, to private, uh, so not OWD controlled by parent, but private. And we'll use share sets as well as 
I will sh use share set. I still I keep the system user as the owner, but I will share use share sets to share the asset with the respective distributor. Is this a something uh, which? Okay, so does it mean that internal users are not going to see assets at all? No, for internal users, I will share them um, via this is also I will share them via Apex Managed Sharing in this case. Okay, could you work me how it's no, going to work? No, yes, I will not. Um, sorry, can I think for a second? Um, so who should see them? Our, no, I will use a criteria based sharing. This is, sorry. I will, we have only a couple of regions, 25 regions. Um, I will stamp on each asset to which, as on ve which vehicle to which region it belongs. And therefore I will um, share it within that. My assumption is the vehicles should be visible within that region for that role. Um, for for this uh, for this within that region, this is my assumption. If this is wrong, I have I have to come up with a different solution. Okay, thank you. Back to you, Lance. Um, so this um, this requirement is quite early in the scenario. Um, standardized processes established for account managers to receive, negotiate, and close orders. Mm -hmm. Um, could you talk about a little bit about how that process works and particularly the receiving orders part of that? Okay. Um, as far as I understood, um, the orders are mostly created by our... Um, hang on a second. Um, the, the orders are um, created by the fleet uh, by the buyers uh, themselves mostly in in our partner community. On top of that, they will just rec receive the order via phone and then create an opportunity with an opportunity product. The opportunity itself has automatically assigned the correct price book based on the distributor's um, tier. And once the, the opportunity, also the negotiation, the order um, is. Succe successful about the volume and the price, we actually create an order about it, out, out of it. Right, so they would create their own opportunities. Yes. In the community. Yeah. Therefore, I gave them the partner community license. Okay. What about new business? How does that work? There was no specific requirement about new business as far as I could see. What I could envision is that once we confirm new business, business that it's success, uh, that it's approved, we create an account and a contact, um, and this account and contact would then be enabled as a partner community user. But in order to separate the negotiation process from the not negotiation process, I would use record types okay, and different sales processes for to control the stage fields. Okay. And um, you also you specified a single org strategy. Um, there's a um, there's a requirement for the um, for the uh, for the process to um, so this is the um, the order receipt negotiation and closing process mm -hmm. uh, to be customizable by geographical region. Um, how yes. do you envisage that? Um, yes, uh, single yeah. org. Um, within a single org, um, this has to be accommodated before, thank you very much for that question, um, right from the start. My recommendation is um, as part of the architecture, but also coding and uh, configuration guidelines to define strict rules around that. I recommend that we have a record types on every single object and have record types for each geographical region. The record type um, is the first rule of entry. So therefore we define the price layouts, the pick list, but also validation rules, triggers and so forth based on these record types. On top of that, we can define additional um, business processes which are um, via custom metadata and custom settings, which again are then triggered via record type. So the record type itself triggers uh, most of it. On top of that, we have sales processes, which define the opportunity stages. Is this along your question? Um, yeah, that's, that's helpful. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Okay, could we go to the governance requirements? Yes. I would like to discuss rolling out uh, the first version of the system to the US. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that you are going to suggest hybrid approach and use whatever only for 
integration and fixed requirements and scrum for the rest. And how we are going to ensure that if we are making the zero to the US only, the system then is going to be flexible enough to cover this local customization for other regions. This is a very good point. This has to be made. This is part of the waterfall part of the Scrum. So the architecture team has to make um, at, anticipate um, together with the global COE and our stakeholders what might be the stuff which is similar and which was the stuff which is different per region. So we can start to define early on which has to be modularized and which part can be fixed across all the regions. This is one of the part of the homework which the company has to be doing before we start with the project. Okay. And uh, you mentioned that they are going to have global CRE and local CRE. Uh, could you explain who is going to be a member of local CREs and how we are going to structure them? Yes, um, part as the local COE are very similar to the global COE. They are just smaller in scope. We have the two different overlapping requirements. First, we have the local development teams in the 10 different cities. On top of that, we have the local requirements, which are also um, reason specific. My assumption is they are similar or overlapping with the um, local development teams. And so the local developer, so the local COE will have as members the local development team and the local subject matter experts, the local QA team, the local PMO team, the local POs. And for the task is within the framework, which is defined by the global COE within the framework of architecture or coding guidelines, development guidelines, um, they will prioritize incoming requests. Um, they will, of course, make sure that the team itself exchanges information and they will work within that framework of the global COE. Okay, thank you. Um, so while, while we're in this section, um, can you talk about there's some requirements around data um, or you perhaps you mentioned something about um, uh, data being populated for scratch orgs and sandboxes um, how what 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 tool will we be will we be using for that um, this is a very good point so um, there's two layers we have for our unit tests we have um, a test data factory which will be part of the base package which creates the test data just for the unit tests itself. But for our developers and our QA team, which needs um, a live human readable test data, this the data itself will be stored as CSVs in our um, Git. So in our branches, in our dev master and release branch, uh, primary and release branch. And then we will use the tool uh, Jenkins to automatic, uh, Copado as part of uh, Jenkins and Copado together as part of the build process for the scratch works, we will populate the test data. On a second thought, I will use the CI tool from Visual Studio Code. When we set up, uh, when we spin up the new Scratch org, then we will actually, um, with our custom script, populate the Scratch uh, the data from our Git. Yeah. Sorry, this is not Copado. Copado will do it in our build org, QA org, and UAT org. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, and there's some requirements here around, um, or there's, there's a part of your solution suggested um, using Provol for automated testing. Which environments will, will that run on and why? It, um, also it, will, it will definitely run on the build org. Also let's start with the automatic testing. The goal of automatic testing is to make sure that we have do not break, break existing functionality. We cannot cover all functionality uh, whichever has been built, so we should have a risk-based matrix in place, which defines which, which important processes have to be tested for regression testing. And so regression um, probably will be used for these UI-based regression tests to make sure our pro core processes still work. And this will be done mostly in the build org, where as part of the build test, a build process uh, provide runs and does all the automatic regression testing. On top of that, I recommend to also do a second smoke automated smoke testing in production environment on a regular basis, for example, nightly with provide and some test data. Is this sufficient to your question? Um, yep, that's helpful, thanks. Okay, so a few times you mentioned that you are going to your skinny tables and I would like to have a short summary on which objects we are going to set them and what are the pros and cons of using skin tables? Thank you very much. This is a very nice question. Um, I, will, I will use the example of the asset object. Uh, skinny tables, also, Salesforce under the hood has uh, for standard field and custom fields actually two different tables. Skinny tables um, enable you to span this into a virtual 
or I don't know if it's technically virtual, but into one table. Um, so you define um, a couple of fields which are often used together with the sales for support and create this guinea table for that. The limitations is that that you cannot set it up yourself. And if it changes, you have to actually um, inform Salesforce about um, the new requirements. So it's very static and it has to be um, defined upfront. So if coming back to the example of our asset vehicle, we have for standard fields, we have, for example, this, um, the serial number or, or the name field. And for custom field, we have a status and we have the external ID, the VIN number. So I would create, I would suggest, this has to be defined later in detail, to have a skinny table which encompasses these standard and custom fields to make it faster on the view, not only in the reports, but only on view as well. Uh, okay, so uh, I will give you a follow-up question and please consider this as a, as a hint. On which objects you can create skinny tables? Ooh, on which objects? Uh, this is a question I cannot answer out of the box. I think on okay. most objects, and but th there are probably a few limitations. Yeah, so the last question in this topic would be, is it possible to create skinny tables on asset objects? Oh, I guess not then. <laughs> <laughs> no, is it not? Is asset the one exception again? <laughs> it's one of exceptions. No! <laughs> this is not fair. <laughs> Okay, I have to read up on the exceptions on skinny tables. Okay, Lawrence? Um, can we talk a bit about the order process? Yes. Again, so on, um, so the order negotiation process. Um, so as part of this, I think you mentioned using a trigger. Am I right to think so you see using a trigger to read from the model allocation object and determine whether the opportunity is over the allocation for the account is that mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um did you consider any other automation options there and why did you choose a trigger yes um there are two alternatives i was considering the first one is to actually have a custom product selection page where we give the feedback to our user immediately and even nicely better formatted which would be um, since uh, if we have, yeah, this is the first option. So I would consider a lighting web component with a method. And the second one is um, we can do it with a flow, um, which where the flow um, actually also can return a custom message. And then um, I was in theory, yeah, this is my second option I was considering. Okay. Because I, I think you had a, you also had a requirement around a process builder that was triggered from the update from the trigger is that yes is that... yes um the um this is a good point the process builder yes um i changed it from process builder to after insert flow after update flow because the process builder from the order f execution um does not run uh, runs after the trigger this is a very good hint thank you very much okay i have to be careful around the order of execution um <laughs> Okay. In the same section, there's um, there's some requirements around uh, values which indicate the financial health of the distributor. Yeah. Um, so I think you mentioned using a Canvas app to surface that from um, from the the is it the finance system some, Account, some other system. accounting system here. Yes. Um, so and then a little bit further down, there's um. Uh, there's a requirement to send the assessments to the manager for approval. The assessment should automatically include the account status information. Um, if we, if that account status information, if we want to include that financial health, is there anything you change in your solution? So can we go back? Um, my assumption was when it says we send the account health information to the management, we actually do not send it as email, but we send a link via email, which um, goes to the standard of uh, to the Salesforce approval page. And on the approval page, we can surface any Lightning Web component we want. And since we already have that Canvas app with a Lightning Web component in place, we can surface the same information as we did before here. If we have to send the uh, um, account health information sent out as an, as an email itself, then we have to create the email as a visual force-based email template where we actually make a REST call out to the accounting system, get the data from the accounting system and bring it back into the email template. Okay. Which one is it? Is it um, should it be displayed as an email or should it be displayed as an approval page? Um, it says send the assessment to management for approval. So I guess uh, 
it's open to interpretation. Um, would you would you consider that secure if you're sending if you're embedding that in an email? No, I would definitely not consider this secure. Therefore, I chose the um, solution with the canvas, with the embedded canvas. Nevertheless, I had um, many experiences where these kind of requests came up, even by very secure as uh, in very regulated systems. Thanks. Okay, so if we already started to speak about emails, if you can go to page number eight. You mentioned that you are going to lock emails and calls in Salesforce for one of the bullets. Yeah, all negotiations between uh, blah, blah, blah. So I would like to ask you how we are going to ensure that literally all emails are going to be available in Salesforce if, for example, our users are sending these emails from Gmail. Yes, this is a very good question. Thank you very much. Um, therefore, we have two different options. The first one is the standard Salesforce option. We use Einstein Emit, Einstein Activity Capture, which automatically takes the email directly from the server, inbound and outbound, and attaches it to the correct customer and op opportunity. Excuse me, this is the standards. Um, if this is not sufficient enough, we have to um, set up a forward in our email relay to forward the, sales, the emails to a Salesforce service address where we have an inbound apex apex inbound email service handler class which in turn stores the salesforce the emails in salesforce okay and which of these options would you set up Einstein, this um, depends on your regulatory requirements. Einstein um, Activity Capture has the downside of being stored on Amazon Web Service and cannot be encrypted with Shield. But since we had no mention of Shield here, I will go with Einstein Activity Capture. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, do you want to go to your um, licenses? Yes. Thank you. Um, so you're distributed to fleet managers, so you've assigned them customer community licenses. Hmm? Is there anything in this scenario that you think might need a higher license type? Um, I'm thinking about the limitation of customer community license. I do not see anything. Um, because they, as, let me go through it. The limitation of customer community is they have not access to standard op uh, sales objects like opportunity quote and so forth. But as an exception, they have access to assets and order, which they have and, and read only to product price book and so forth. Um, they have access to account and contact. They have, do not have advanced sharing, but we can use share sets here on the order and the asset itself. And they do not have access to reports, but I couldn't see any requirements on reports. Maybe I missed something there. This is just something I would check. Maybe the, oh yeah, uh, they should be able to, no, actually not. Can you maybe give me a hint there? I think you might be right, actually. I think there's another external group. I think it's the buyers actually need um, report access. Yes, they want to report on their own performance and therefore have the partner community license. Yeah. yeah. So maybe let's go to this reporting requirements because I would like to ask about the first point. Yes. Mm -hmm. You suggested to your standard Salesforce reports for analyze selling trends. And could you remind me what are the limitations of trending reports in Salesforce? Um, if you, yes, um, as this depends, there's kind of two different types of trending reports. There's the Salesforce trending reports, which you can set up with a couple of clicks. They only can compare three different dates, but they are super easy to set up. Nevertheless, they can, for some fields, they can look into the past, but for most fields, they have to be set up um, advance of time. And then you have reporting snapshots where you actually create snapshots um, in a defined interval. You can compare as many dates as you want, uh, but you cannot set them up um, retroactively. So um, on top of that, you can only get a 2000 rows. So we have to group up and in our case, we have about 10,000 distributors as far as I could see. So we would have to create five, five different reporting snapshots. Okay, thank you. Um, so there was a requirement around um, 
I think it's the is it the buyers being able to track the location of orders? In, I, I think it was in, the fleet managers, maybe. Fleet managers. Okay, so um, I think you mentioned that that information being um, retrieved in real time. Yes. Um, and can you talk a bit about how that would be displayed on the page? Yes. Um, let me walk you through. Um, I would like to walk you through along the system landscape. Um, yes. So um, let, my assumption is the inventory system can provide the location, the current location in the form of GPS coordinates. Then we will use the standard sales, for, uh, the, then we will use the uh, lighting web component, which displays the standard sales for maps component, where we can create a pin. And the pin is then defined via the GPS location. And this in turn then displays um, the current location. On top of that, I would, if we need to see the real address and the inventory system is not providing us the real address of the current GPS location, we can make a call out to um, Google to get the correct address. Cool. Okay, thanks. Um, and so there's also there's some um, requirements that you suggested using a Canvas app. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about which, which flow, which Canvas app flow would you use for that? Yes, I would like. I would like to choose, of course, the pre-approved by admin um, signed request flow, because this is the biggest advantage of the Canvas app that um, the so this target system or the source system actually um, can skip can use a very simplified version of the OAuth flows as so basically only get the signed requests, which in turn it can then use as an access token for further requests to Salesforce. So how it works is sales, um, the Canvas app is loaded. If the can if the user if the user is already signed into the internet and via single sign on um, already is a via single sign on already authenticated in the accounting system. This is one of the assumptions that the users are part of the accounting system. Um, then the Canvas app is loaded. The Canvas app itself checks if the connected app if the user is pre-approved for the connected app, which I set up. Um, if and then it loads the Canvas app and sends the signed request to the and then Salesforce sends the signed request via post method to the accounting system or the web app and the web app then takes the signed request for any further to um, API requests to Salesforce. Okay. Thanks. Any more details on that? No, that's, uh, that's good. Thanks. Should we layer it maybe with one or two or three layers? Well, while we're, while we're talking flows, do you want to um, talk us through the uh, user agent flow for the partner app mobile publisher? Yes, please. yes, of course. Um, um, in this case, we have three different actors. Uh, we have the client, we have the authorization server and the resource server. The client is our partner app mobile publisher, which does the user agent flow. I chose the user agent flow because the mobile app cannot be trusted with the client secret or um, because it cannot protect the client secret because it's outside of our control. Um, so therefore we go with the user agent flow and so the client itself makes a request to the authorization endpoint with the response type token, uh, with the client ID, the scope and the states and the redirect URL, then the, the authorization endpoint uh, check asks the user as a checks first the client ID and if the callback URL um, matches the redirect URL, ask the user for login and consent if the user did not consent before, um, then in turn um, validates, then um, it returns the access token via and the call access token and the state and the scope um, via redirect to the callback URL or, or the redirect URL. And then the client um, extracts from the URL the access token and then uses the access token for any um, further API request as the token bearer. You didn't mention a refresh token, is that? Involved? I did not ref mention the refresh token. Technically, the user agent can have the refresh token, but um, since the, yeah. Technically, it can. It depends on the scope which is defined. Okay. So, um, so I've got another um, system landscape question. So, um, so I know the so the reporting requirements in the scenario didn't mention this, but if we wanted to, um, if we wanted to use information from the data warehouse, the inventory system, uh, Salesforce data. Um, in our business intelligence reports, what um, what would you would you suggest changing anything in your landscape? As it, the uh, Tableau is technically outside of the system, and te technically this is a very good point. Tableau takes the data from the ETL, 
and from the and, uh, from also via the via the ETL from the data warehouse and from the inventory system. I just drew it onto Salesforce because to indicate that it's very close to Salesforce. So we, mm -hmm. if you say we have a report which encompasses Salesforce data, data warehouse data, and inventory system data, I would have three different recipes or three different ways of pulling data into Tableau and then combining it there. Is this okay. the answer you Could have been looking for? Um, yeah. Yeah, more or less. How does it? How does the data get from? How, uh, how does the ETL communicate with Tableau and pass the data across? Um, the, it does it via the by, via the REST API. Bulk <laughs> API. So kind of, I don't know. I think it's got its own APIs actually. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. I have to read up on that. But I remember Tableau theorem. <laughs> I'm impressed. Bang up to date. Two yeah. days old, though, isn't it? Isn't that? Hey, so staying on the system landscape, uh, could you explain why you are suggesting to use Okta instead of some Salesforce belonging product? Such a tough question there, Jakob. Um, yes, um, there's Salesforce Identity Connect in place, which but Salesforce Identity Connect unfortunately only works with Active Directory and not with LDAP. Therefore, I chose Okta. Okay, thank you. And of course, on top of that, Salesforce Identity Connect is, um, let's say, an, a rather old product. Oh, you know, odd, but it's bulletproof solution. <laughs> okay. Absolutely, and it, it, it has an advantage over Okta, actually, one. <laughs> yeah, please explain. It can immediately lock out the user based on an up on, on deactivating an in Active Directory, which Okta cannot. And even if you deprovision the user until the session times out, um, the user is still active in Salesforce. Nice. Okay. But now going to the more tough question, if you can go to your branch uh, strategy. No. Yeah. Yes. Of course. I'm super conf I confident there. I have a few questions here, but starting from the most curious, you mentioned that if something went wrong during the testing process, you are going to remove code from your dev branch. And I would like to understand how it's, it's going to happen. Um, this is a question I have. There is something I would say rebase also, but this is a question I have to pass actually. Okay, sure. So uh, second question will be about the Jenkins. Uh, as Jenkins is going to make your CI CD deployment, could you explain? No, no, no not sorry. Um, I only need, maybe I made a mistake there. Um, in order to integrate Copado with Prova, you need a Jenkins in place. Jenkins is not used for the whole CI CD pipeline, but only for this particular use case. And for the deployments themselves, Copado is used. Okay, and so in this case, how Copado is going to be said to have access to production org? How can how the security is going to work in the pipeline? Copado is set up as a system admin user, and okay, using, yeah. <laughs> and using um, trusted IP. P, uh, uh, for has a, has a specific profile for an integration user, an API only user, and we have set up, of course, um, the trust, uh, not the trusted, a uh, restricted IP range for that profile. And on top of that, uh, that we um, require for the login a higher assurance session, so it always has to send along the security key. How, how, how is it authenticating? Um, I am. Honestly, I'm not 100% expert with Copado. I think it still uses the username and password flow. Okay. I, I know that Okta does. I'm not 100% sure how Copado does it. Okay. Well, I'm not Copado expert as well, but if I will use it in my solution, I will probably prefer to know how it works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Good point. Good point. Do you have anything else? I think so. Oh, one more. <laughs> what's, the, what's the primary branch? Is that yes, the master um, branch or is that something else? Um, yeah, there was a, a, 
in the light of the recent development, um, the master branch is not named master branch anymore, and many people go over to use it, calling it primary branch. The word master has some negative connotations. Mm. Oh, interesting. Thanks. No, cool. That's um, that's everything.